Welcome back. In my last video, I just finished the planning stage for my live drum machine patch. Today I'm going to walk you through my week, following the progress right up until I got the patch finished. This video is all about the patch. I gave myself eight days to finish the patch, which is much more time than I need. So here's what my week looked like. Day one, I couldn't do any work because I was preparing for another gig, one that's entirely unrelated to this video series. Day two was playing the aforementioned gig, and with that out of the way, I could finally get to work and stop procrastinating. Day three, I spent procrastinating. Day four, I spent procrastinating. Day five, I spent procrastinating, mixed with existential dread and self-doubt since I hadn't got any work done yet. Day six was hanging out with friends and feeling bad about not getting any work done. Day seven, I did a marathon 10 hour coding session and got everything completed, at least until the file corrupted and I lost everything. Day eight, I spent another seven hours rebuilding the patch entirely from scratch. And once that was complete, I was all done. So here's a rundown of my process. I broke the task down into the smallest possible steps and gave myself a checklist to follow. This is so that I can keep track of my progress as I work, so that it doesn't seem like an insurmountable task to get all the work done. The first thing on the list was to make a mixer. In this patch, there are a lot of parts that I'm copying and adapting from previous work. I have a 23 channel mixer that I coded previously with a built-in multi-track recorder. So I just relabeled the eight channels to what I needed to use it for and left it at that. Next up was making all the instruments. I made a wavetable kick drum module with an input for regular beats and also for accented beats, which would be a little bit louder. Some of the notable features of this are a kick detune function, which is required to get the nice thump sound that you're used to hearing with kick drums, and then a wave folder effect so that I have some tonal parameters to play with when I'm playing live. And then I also had a button that randomly selects a new wavetable for the kick drum oscillator so that I can change the sound in real time and have some variation throughout the set. For the snare, I added a noise source into the oscillator that was modulating the primary oscillator and then added a bandpass filter to sculpt the sound into a nice snare thwack sound. For the hi-hats, I used raw noise going through bandpass filters and high-pass filters. For the burst sound, I have a module that sends a burst of trigger outputs that start at a high frequency and then get a little slower as the envelope progresses. For these sort of sounds, I feel like it's important to have a bit of randomization in the pitch and to also have a really steep detune curve at the attack of the sound so that all the individual chirp noises are distinct from each other. Next up is a metallic striking sound. Here I have a modulation oscillator that's playing a semitone higher that I use to modulate the primary oscillator playing at the root frequency. I also mix this with a noise source. The beating of the modulation oscillator against the primary oscillator creates a nice clang sound that is good enough to make it sound like an artificial metallic strike. The next task was to make a sequencing section. For this, I copied a beat playing module that I made for a previous patch, which is a software clone of the Mutable Instruments Grids module, but with plenty more of my own options and also all of my own patterns. For this module, I made a whole heap of modifications and routing changes to fit the module with what I wanted to use it for. And I made a little subsection to handle simpler beats so that I could do pulse beats rather than just the breakbeat style beats that this is good for. I split all of these beats into categories defining how syncopated, straight ahead, or pulse-like the rhythms were, and then programmed a function that selects a random beat based on those categories. The next part is MIDI control. I routed my MIDI controller in a layout that was very close to my initial design document. And then once I could actually play the device with my hands, I realized that I needed to make a bunch of changes to make it play a little closer to how I originally wanted it. I usually find that no matter how much I plan things out, I always need to make some last minute changes to get it sounding right. And so with the MIDI controller completed, that was everything all done. So today I have rehearsals and tomorrow I have the gig itself. So I'll try to capture some video of the setup, rehearsals and the night of the gig itself for the final installment of this video series. That's everything I wanted to talk about today. So thanks for watching.